Chapter 2, There Were No Strangers On Friday, August 31st, 1984, as she did every morning, Maddie arose by five. She got into her bathrobe and slippers, put on her glasses, and made her way across the dark hallway. In the kitchen, she turned on the lights and began making a pot of coffee. She then walked through her dining room and living room to the entrance, opened the front door, and collected her morning paper. As always, she swept the low, wide stairs and front porch. Ritual and routine were important, cleanliness and appearance vital. She was proud of her home, and things had to be just so. Next, she watered the flowers and plants surrounding the porch. The stream from the hose gleamed silver beneath the street lamp. With daybreak still an hour away, it already felt hot. The last day of August would be another scorcher in South Central, with the temperature once again hitting 100. As she re-entered, she left the front door open to cool the house. The screen door rattled closed behind her. She left it unlocked. Maddie's home at 126 West 59th Street was known to all as an open house where family, neighbors, and local kids were always welcome. She loved to play the hostess, and her home represented a community resource, a sanctuary where the residents of South Central would gather informally and talk about family, the church, local politics, or neighborhood going-ons. At Maddie's, it was always community time, a place where the private and public were one, where the word stranger was unknown and the word family meant everyone who walked in the door. As usual, she expected people to come and go throughout the day. Maddie had raised 11 children. She liked it best when the house was full. Lately, however, many of us had quarreled with her over the house. We stressed that the neighborhood had changed. East side problems kept creeping west. She'd been there 17 years. It was time to move on and somewhere nice, further west like Ladera Heights. She would listen and tell us that she'd think about it, but we all knew she was in no rush. I'd even gone so far as to make a down payment on a house in a better part of town. But even that didn't convince her. Yes, she admitted she'd seen changes over the years. Her neighborhood of Florence had become blacker, poorer, and though she had tried not to think about it, more dangerous. Gunshots and drive-bys were frequent. The police helicopter were constant. Just over a year ago, Maddie herself was mugged, her purse ripped from her hands. But despite the encroaching disorder, she remained. The robbery was a fluke, she insisted. The media exaggerated the decline. She resented her community being labeled a ghetto. A tour of her neighborhood revealed mostly good people going about their lives, caring for their properties. Certainly it bore no resemblance to the burned out Bronx or Chicago's high rise hells. It was mostly single family bungalows, small yards, and palm lined streets. Now, in the early morning, as she made her way onto the porch and looked about at her plants and yard, the thought of leaving made her sad. She was loyal to her home and neighborhood, and she had felt a sense of duty. She provided a service. She reached out to the community and literally brought it into her home. She was doing God's work, playing a part in his plan. She brought stability. She was one of the few remaining role models. Why should good people like her move forfeit what they had worked for, dreamed of, and abandoned the neighborhood. She wanted the community to stick together, and she wasn't going to be the one to leave kids behind. If I left, she asked, then who would give them hugs and make them peanut butter sandwiches? She always said that little acts made for big differences. Hug a kid, save a block, then a neighborhood, and so on. And no one could deny it, she had presence, a way about her that made kids listen. And besides, Maddie was tough. She had survived 11 childbirths, 11 children, Jim Crow segregation, a cross-country migration, a marital split, public housing, and the Watts riots. Surely, another tough neighborhood was just another hurdle, another one of his tests. And as always, she would pass. She would muscle through. We all told her she was stubborn, but she took it as a compliment. There was nothing wrong with a little bit of stubbornness, she'd say. It showed heart. It helped you hold on. And besides, it was her home. She liked it, and she didn't feel like moving. And that was that, she had her rump to herself as she walked from the porch back into the house. As she returned to her kitchen carrying the newspaper, she passed the front bedroom where her sister Dietra slept. She would soon move out of the house for the first time, following her upcoming wedding. My nephews, Damani and Damon, also slept in the bedroom. 
Damani, as he did every year, came from the South San Francisco Bay Area to spend the summer with his grandmother, while Damon, an LA native, was visiting for the weekend. Both boys would return to school following Labor Day. Maddie would miss them. She said the kids made it a true home again. In the kitchen, she poured her first cup of coffee and made some toast. Then she put a kettle of beans on the stove to simmer. They took hours to cook. She planned to serve them for dinner. Maddie's red beans and rice were legendary. The house was quiet, save for the hum of the harbor freeway to the west. In the back bedroom, two other family members slept. My brother, Neil, 33, and nephew, Ivan, 14. Maddie knew she would be the only one awake for hours to come. Maddie sewed and ironed the vestments for the clergy, helped the parish principal manage the children, and then let loose with multiple rounds of bingo. But as she pondered her pleasant week, she wasn't able to shake a negative feeling that continued to intrude. The previous evening when my sister Daphne dropped off her boys, Damon and Ivan, she told Maddie that lately Damon seemed troubled and insecure. She said he would follow her around the house, refusing to be out of her presence. He had requested that she read him reassuring Bible stories and even mused as to what a wonderful place heaven must be. He cried uncharacteristically and insisted on sleeping in his mother's bed. When asked what was wrong, he was unable to say, simply answering with an unconvincing nothing. Maddie had tried to push the thoughts aside. Like most childhood fears, she would have assured herself Damon's insecurities would soon pass. The cause was probably just sadness over summer's end, anxiety over entering a new grade. Boosted by the coffee and the first signs of the sun, her mood brightened. Nothing would better cheer the boy than a weekend filled with family and friends at grandma's house. After all, he had begged his mother to let him stay the weekend at Maddie's with his cousins. And as he went to bed last night, he at least seemed happy, smiling, joking. He specifically said how excited he was about the plans to go to the Coliseum the following day, where they would search for the remaindered souvenir pins on South Flower Street and take in the afterglow of the recently concluded Olympic Games. Maddie too had caught Olympic fever especially after she had attended the games, where Mayor Tom Bradley, a longtime family friend, recognized her and greeted her warmly before a large crowd. Afterward, she was so thrilled, she said she had floated home. She couldn't wait to tell her family and friends. The 1984 Los Angeles Summer Olympics were a magical time for my family and community and marked a turning point for the city. Securing LA as the host represented a major coup for Mayor Bradley. Tom Bradley, the city's first black mayor, had a long and path-breaking history in Los Angeles. After his family migrated from the Deep South in the 1920s, Bradley attended the Polytechnic High School and then received a track scholarship to UCLA. He next served for 20 years in the Los Angeles Police Department, becoming the first black lieutenant. Bradley then became the first black elected to the city council before becoming mayor where he would serve an unprecedented five terms. For blacks throughout LA, Tom Bradley was a hero and an inspiration, athlete, trailblazer, visionary. With the Olympic Games, he sought to establish Los Angeles as a true world city, a major node in the globalizing world. As the opening ceremonies began, the Coliseum and South Central LA took center stage. Thousands of dubs and streamers soared. Mayor Bradley waved the Olympic flag. President Ronald Reagan addressed the crowd. When he spoke, two and a half billion people around the world listened, making it the largest audience in the history of mankind. More athletes and nations attended these games than any before. As each team was announced, the Coliseum roared. For Mayor Bradley, the event marked the end of a 10-year struggle to return the games to Los Angeles, where they had been last held in 1932, and where a 14-year-old Tom Bradley peered through the fence. Four years later, his idol, track star Jesse Owens, shocked Hitler in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. In 1984, Olympics were filled with hopes and tensions. The games focused the world's attention upon the whole city. Success means glory, disaster, an international black eye. Record security stood in place to counter rumored terrorist threats. While designed by the ancient Greeks to bring nations together in a spirit of competitive peace, it didn't always work out. The tragedy of Munich and the slaying of the Israeli wrestling team by the Palestinian terrorist organization Black September were just two Olympics removed. 
and for Mayor Bradley, security concerns were particularly acute. In 1982, he lost a heartbreaking gubernatorial election to George Duke Majin, who got the right of him on law and order, tarring Bradley as soft on crime. Further, an eerie hypercharged mood marked the lead up to the 1984 games as they signaled a final host flash into the Cold War. On Christmas Day in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and despite international condemnation, refused to withdraw. In retaliation, the United States boycotted the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow. In return, the Soviets, along with 13 communist allies, refused to attend the 1984 Summer Games. An electric patriotism surged through the city. To everyone's relief, the Games ended in triumph. The United States took home a record 83 gold medals. The security stood sound. The Olympic Village remained safe. And unlike many previous Olympiads, the Los Angeles Summer Games and the leadership of the U.S. Olympic Committee Chairman Peter Uberoth proved a stunning financial success. One city councilman called the games a Super Bowl of all Super Bowls and a masterpiece, while Chairman Ubera said if I were giving out medals for leadership, Tom Bradley would get the gold. Following the closing ceremonies, composer John Williams' epic Olympic fanfare and theme filled the Coliseum. Fireworks lit the night sky. The public address announcer's voice ended the evening. The games are over. Now the memories begin. The memories included the University of Southern California's own O.J. Simpson and Jesse Owens' granddaughter serving as torchbearers, the 1960 Declathon winner and UCLA alum Rafford Johnson lighting the Olympic logo, the heroics of Carl Lewis equaling Jesse Owens' four gold medals in track and field, and gymnast Mary Lou Retton closing out her performances with two perfect tens. America was always seen as a place to start a new life. California, a place to chase a dream, and Los Angeles, a land of hope. Sold as a place to restore health with the Mediterranean climate akin to the Greek Isles, it was the perfect site for a Summer Olympic Games. And in the Olympics, as in a Hollywood script, small town kids from all over the world flocked to the land of make-believe and returned bearing gold. For a couple of weeks in the summer of 1984, the dream was revived, flickering across the screen in a brief but brilliant instant. For as the crowds dispersed and the athletes returned home, Los Angeles had captured the global imagination. The city shone with the glow of renewal and arrival. The triumph left us with a sense of collective pride. As the Coliseum was located in South Central and as Mayor Bradley himself once walked a neighborhood beat, local residents took a stake in the games. Our neighborhood hosted the Olympics and shined before the world. For just a moment, our community wasn't on the outside, forgotten and left behind. Briefly, we stood at the center and for once, for the right reasons, on the front page, but not because of riots, drugs and murders. Triumph brought one large collective exhale. For Maddie and my family, the communal victory was personal. We had lived in South Central for 40 years and had known Mayor Bradley for almost as long. When he said the Olympic spirit brought people together, making them forget their prejudices as they celebrated human excellence, we cheered, feeling a fresh sense of hope. My brother Gordon recalled the Olympics as one of the most amazing things he'd ever seen, with the city coming together as one, without factions. I remember South Central at that time as exuberant, with residents taking a renewed pride in place in their yards and lawns. Gordon said that Los Angeles in August 1984 was a place in which there were no strangers. Two miles south of the Coliseum, Maddie replaced her coffee on the kitchen table and read the morning paper. She listened for signs of stirring. The younger boy Damon usually rose early, then woke his cousin to play, but she heard nothing. The house remained silent as her family slept. Not far from her home, a 75 Chevy van rolls east on Slauson. The avenue was South Central's major east-west artery. It is named after a land developer, J.S. Slauson, a 19th century L.A. booster, who sold the region as a land of orange groves and haciendas, a place where anyone could start anew. In the decades following the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in the 1860s, millions traveled west, transforming L.A. from sleepy Pueblo to modern metropolis. By 1920, Los Angeles surpassed San Francisco as the state's largest city. 
By mid-century, Slauson Avenue was a booming industrial center, the home of the Bethlehem Steel Mill, where thousands were employed. Now, in 1984, a new global economics prevails. The plants had moved and the mills closed. Post-industrial blight remains. The van is driven by a black female. Her friend rides shotgun. Three black men sit in the back. The van is industrial with no rear side windows. The men sit in heavy shadows. Just after dawn, the storefronts on Slauson remain gated. The van drives past an auto body and muffler shop. The van drives past auto body and muffler shops, wholesale carpeting and furniture, barbecue joints, checks cash, donuts, liquor store, Episcopal and Baptist churches, old tires, vacant lots. The streets are ashen, dead to dreams. The rising sun spreads through the smog on the horizon. Discarded furniture and abandoned cars litter the street. Folks walk about like zombies. The van continues east past barber shops, beauty salons, mini marts, a burger stand, a bar, a Methodist church, a chain link fence, a shuttered store. When it reaches the intersection of Slauson and Western, the gas gauge is pegged at empty. The driver turns into the Shell gas station, gets out, and pumps $2 worth. Inside the van, there is no talk. The silence is broken as the driver returns, slams the door, and restarts the engine. She peers at the gas gauge. Two dollars barely budges the needle. Pulling into the light early morning traffic, the driver continues east on Slauson. Passing beneath the harbor freeway, the van falls into shadows, then returns to face the rising sun. It makes a right turn on Broadway and heads south until it reaches West 59th Street, where it turns left, then slows to a crawl in front of number 126. It rolls to a stop a couple of doors down the street just west of Maine. The sliding door on the van's right side opens. Three black men begin to exit curbside. One is told to stay with the women. He returns to the rear of the van. The other two leave the vehicle and begin walking westbound. The motor is kept running. The sliding door remains open. The two men pass a blue bungalow on their left, number 122. As they approach the next home, 126, they turn up the walkway and toward the low front porch. A small patch of lawn lies on each side of the path. The porch has two wide steps. It is set beneath the brick columns and surrounded by plants. The porch is wet. Someone has recently watered. The front door is open, with only a screen door standing guard. The house is silent. As the two men approach, one pulls a small metal object from his waistband and holds it in his hand. The other clutches something wrapped in a light blue jacket. From the kitchen in the rear of the house, Maddie heard the front screen door open, then swing shut. She figured it must be me. Every Friday morning, I came over for coffee. She glanced at the time. It was just before 8. I was running late. From within the sleeping house, she heard footsteps approaching through the living room, then into the dining room. But from inside the kitchen, she could not see their source. At any second, she expected to hear me say, Maddie. Hearing no greeting, she called out, Kermit, is that you? She received no response, only continued footfalls. Kermit, she repeated, Kermit.